awesome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ashley Jones. I'm the Managing Director of Community Programs here at the Venture Center. And we've got such a great lunch and learn for you today on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've got five very smart, talented, and strong women with us to discuss these topics, but also to provide some actionable steps that we can take to be more diverse, equitable, and inclusive, both professionally and personally. Before we dive in, just a few programs that the Venture Center has coming up. Tomorrow the 9th is the final day to submit your application to be a part of our SPARK program. So if you're an entrepreneur with a business making between $25,000 and $100,000 a year and you meet the other criteria that's involved, we encourage you to apply and I'll drop a link in the chat with more information on that. Also, we have several community programs coming up. We have a VC chat this Friday about economic development in Arkansas's Delta region, a woman run with Tamika Edwards on the 17th, and a Lift the Rock next Friday with Remix Ideas. And all of our programs can be found on our website by subscribing to our newsletter and following us on Facebook and all of our other social channels. So we encourage you to do that to keep up with all the latest and greatest from us. Lastly, a big, big thank you and a shout out to our community program sponsors, uh, Wright Lindsay Jennings, Frost, CFO Network, and the Little Rock Chamber for their continued support of all of our programs. Our moderator for this discussion will be Emma Willis, who is a senior strategist for Mangan Holcomb Partners. Here she's responsible for providing strategic planning and counsel to ensure that clients in the government, financial, and other sectors benefit from advancements in data-driven marketing to meet their growth objectives. Before joining MHP, Emma was with the Arkansas State Treasurer, starting in IT and eventually moving on to work with the Arkansas 529 Gift College Investing Plan. And for more than 10 years, she's dedicated her skills to the expansion of the state's 529 College Investing Plan, where she grew it to $1 billion in assets. Originally from Little Rock, Emma holds a Bachelor of Business Administration degree from Philander Smith College. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Emma, who will introduce each of our panelists and then kick it off with questions. So thank you all for all being right. here. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you for that awesome introduction. Today, I am joined by a panel of some illustrious women. I was actually, su I'm super enamored and happy to be able to introduce you all. First up, we have Miss Marty North. She is Senior Vice President, Director of Community Development with Simmons Bank. We also have Ms. Jennifer Martinez-Belt, who is the CEO of Martinez-Belt Consulting. We have Ms. Amber Booth McCoy, CEO of the Diversity Booth Incorporated, and Ms. Denise Ennett, Arkansas State Representative here at the state of Arkansas. So what are we talking about today? Our topic is equity and inclusion and pretty much what does that mean? How are they different? And how do we become more diverse, equitable and inclusive? So I'm gonna ask each panelist and I'm gonna start out with Amber to give us a little bit of background about yourself and what it is that you do. Um, I am a senior diversity specialist as well as the manager for intercultural education at the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences in the Division for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So I oversee our um, intercultural education, such as implicit bias, race. Um, I serve as an internal consultant for the institution and provide executive leadership in the sense that um, everyone needs to know the lens, if you will, that diversity, equity, inclusion, and how we plan our strategies and initiatives around that. Um, I also have a diversity consulting firm, which is the diversity booth, where I do the same thing for organizations and institutions around the nation. Thank you. Next up, we have Ms. Jennifer Martinez. Hi everyone, thanks for having me be part of this amazing panel. Um, I'm Jennifer Martinez Speltz. I'm the president of Martinez Belt Consulting that focuses on nonprofit and development. Especially for this topic, it focuses on board development and philanthropy and where that meets in the middle. So industry is very important, but so are the foundations and nonprofits that run our communities. So I work with different nonprofits, not just to raise money, but to build, again, what Amber said, that lens and what it looks like to have um, people of different backgrounds represent um, the services they provide. Thank you. Next up, Ms. Denise Ennett.
Denise is not there. I'm going to go right ahead to Ms. Marty North. Um, thank you so much uh, to the Venture Center and my fellow panelists and Emma for being already a fabulous moderator. Um, as was stated in my intro, I'm a Senior Vice President and Director of Community Development here at Simmons Bank for our entire uh, seven state footprint, so $21 billion asset bank. Um, my area of specialty happens to be Regulation B, the Community Reinvestment Act which a lot of people don't really understand that particular piece of regulation, but from a response to formal, formally legalized um, forms of discrimination within equity, Regulation BB is one of those uh, pieces of legislation that is directly focused on addressing some of those access to capital challenges that had been a part of our uh, political um, and legal framework for uh, generations. So that is my uh, particular day job area of expertise. And I also have um, a, a separate company, System Critical, which engages in cultural competency trainings as well. Awesome. All right, if you ladies are ready, um, has Denise joined us yeah, I'm actually here. by chance? There can she you is. Hear me? Hi. Hi. Yes, we can. Hi, I'm Denise Ennett. I am the state representative for District 36, which is parts of downtown and all of East Little Rock, including um, the county. I have Hensley, Woodson, uh, Wrightsville, College Station, all those lovely communities are in my district. Um, I first started being active in the community. Um, me and Jennifer, we both have a son. Um, sons on the spectrum and that's how I started um, using my voice um, advocating for my son and from there um, I started joining different commissions and boards and um, last week was the first was the year I mean last week marked the first year of me being um, elected I won my election last um, September um, my runoff election so I'm still kind of newish to this scene and um, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here with all these wonderful women and um, I'm excited. Thank you. And Denise, we're happy to have you. So let's dive in. All the buzz right now with the current state of our country, politics and just the sheer movement of Black Lives Matter has led us to the conversation around diversity, equity and inclusion. And a lot of us hear the words, don't necessarily know what they all mean. And what we're looking for today is some clarification. So we want to start out and understand what these words mean in relationship to each one of you and your professional lives. And Denise, since you were my last speaker, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off with you. Okay, so diversity. Um, so you have two chambers. You have the Senate and you have the House of Representatives. Um, currently, there are only 27 um, women that are serving in the House of Representatives. And out of 27, there's four African-American women um, that are serving. And for me, representation matters. Um, the legislature need to look like Arkansas. So for me, diversity means having unique voices at the table. Um, let me go on to inclusion. Let's just stick with diversity for a second, and then I'll take it directly over to Jennifer. Okay. Diversity as it relates to you professionally. Professionally, it, it gives me that opportunity to get a range of perspectives. So diversity is not just your ethnicity or race, it's your abilities, it's your age, it's your um, geography, your economic status. Um, in my nonprofit experience, that's what I'm looking for in a diverse group. Is, is your abilities, all the different things that bring a different range of voice. Thank you. Marty, give us your insight. So professionally for me, diversity actually means diversity and opportunity. And so then when you look into different areas and aspects, who is in the room, who has opportunities to get access to the room as well. So um, oftentimes you can see individuals kind of concentrated in certain particular pockets of uh, an industry or a corporation, but meaningful diversity means that there is a wider distribution of these talents 
across a variety of uh, business lines and units. So diversity is representation as uh, Representative Ennett had explained, but also who gets access to being in the room. Ooh, access. Okay, so Amber, this is your wheelhouse 100%. I'm going to ask you about diversity and then I'm gonna move directly into another question with you. So give me a uh, diversity for you as it relates to you and your professional life. Um, Similar to what all of these women have said, diversity is most certainly representation. It is who's at the table, the voices that are at the table, and is that table representative of the population? Does it parody the population that it's trying to assist, pretty much? Okay, so the next thing is going to be equity. And I think for you, Amber, you probably will be the best suited to give us the difference between equity and equality. So start off there for us. Um, I don't know if best suited because there's some amazing women <laughs> on this panel, but um, equality is when we give everything the same, whereas equity is when we give what is needed to whom it is needed. Um, equity is a concept that we that we use all the time, but when it comes to professional life or when we hear it um, in rhetoric, if you will, then we don't. I'm not gonna give my 17 year old the same thing I give my 14 year old because what they need is different, right? That's equity to give what is needed to whom it is needed. So these are things that we do all the time, but when we say it in professional settings and it's like, oh no, equality is what we must do, but equality is already a law. We're not able to treat people differently based on the color of their skin, based on sex, based on equality is legal. Equity is how we're going to move the needle in these places and change the disparities in healthcare outcomes, education, business, finance, you name it. Equity is how we get there. That's the vehicle that we're going to use to make sure that things get to a place of equality. Thank you. All right. Um, Jennifer, follow that up. Thanks. Um, ditto on everything. Again, it's that quality value aspect for me with equity. It's making sure that it's more of the seat at the table. That's where my, my definition falls into the different from diversity is making sure that that um, opportunity is not just available, but that it's valued and that it has some action behind um, its place. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, Denise, give us your idea of equity versus equality and how it relates to you in your professional life or what you see in your professional life. So um, ditto to what Amber said. It's hard to go. It's hard to speak out to her because she's an expert in this. Um, how I see um, equality, um, you have the ERA, which is the Equal Rights Amendment. You have um, that hasn't passed here in Arkansas in every so often it comes up and it never goes through. Um, equal work for equal pay. Um, if you do the same work as your counterpart, you should be able to get the same pay. So for me, I look at things like that. I look at equality in education. There's still some barriers there um, that can be worked on. And I know, you know, if the app, for women to be serving, we help move the needle because sometimes when we're absent, the policies don't reflect the equality. So that's good that women are now um, being at the table instead of on the table. So hopefully we can help change, move the needle towards equality in the future. Thank you. And last but not least, Ms. North. Oh, such a, oh my goodness. Yeah, uh, to follow what these women have said, I'm like, what can I say different? Um, I would say from the perspective of equality is an ever moving target. Okay, so today we would say you're on e we're being treated equal because we're um, engaging in this action or this law or this practice. Um, equity acknowledges at some point people have not been treated fairly. And so in order to address that, something has to be done to to bring an equity to the table. So if you are aware, especially historically in every framework referenced previously, there are and have been systemic um, areas of um, inequity. And so to overcome them, you've got to um, engage in an, a practice of equity, which is the pie is big enough for everyone. 
it is not a small pie and that I'm, and, and moving to equity is not taking anything from anyone else. It actually makes us all better. Um, if we are allowing those individuals, like I gave the example earlier, who are in the room to actually sit at the table, um, actually can be very um, advantageous to everyone. So equality to me is always a moving, a moving target because we don't fully get there either because of our different lens and framework on how we want to shape equality as well. And I'm gonna stick with you and I'm gonna let you talk to me about inclusion and, and, and what that looks like in a professional setting. So you see, I keep using this, I guess it's this Charlie Brown animated strip. And I'm enjoying it, go ahead. Other um, visuals um, that are just standing out in my head. So I mentioned diversity, you're in the room, equity at the table, including mm -hmm. voices being listened to, valued, respected, incorporated into the conversation. So oftentimes people get invited to a space, but they have no power in that space. They're not elevated, honored, or respected. Or you get this, okay, you can be here, but we're really not gonna lift honor what you are adding to the conversation. So inclusion to me says you, you've cleared the first two hurdles. Now do you see me, hear me, listen to me, value and respect the um, expertise, vantage point and perspective that I bring to this space, especially if my voice is different than yours. So that's inclusion to me. I, I, I can't appreciate the illustration. Sometimes we need that and that's what you do in this conversation. Uh, next up, I'm gonna ask Jennifer, same question, inclusion. So inclusion in my profession would be obviously similar and it's being able to contribute fully. Um, not just marking the box to make sure that we meet some sort of imaginary idea or put a picture up of someone's um, biography or image. It's really making sure that there's a complete full commitment to that voice that brings the diversity and equality all to the table. So inclusion is like, like Marty said, that the final step to making sure all this works and contributing fully to a board or, or foundation um, atmosphere. Wonderful, thank you for that. Amber, inclusion. Um, so similar to what these ladies have said and with the same imagery, um, diversity is being invited to the party. Um, inclusion is being asked to dance once you're at the party. And equity is making sure everyone has a ride to the party. So when I think about diversity, equity, inclusion, diversity is definitely the representation. Um, inclusion is the culture once I'm at that table. Like they said, is my voice being heard? Am I being valued? And equity is the part that we, the intentionality, if you will, in getting those people to that table. So inclusion is the culture that I experience once I'm there. Thank you for that. Denise. Yes, yeah, so for me, inclusion is um, advocating for my constituents um, on different matters, um, advocating for those who are excluded, and so making it, making policies, implementing policies so everybody can be included. For me, that's inclusion. And I use my son as, as an example again, uh, with his disability. As a parent, you want your child to be included um, in classroom activities, you want them to be just, you want them to be part of the conversation. And for me, opening those doors for the people who have been excluded, that's what that means to me. Thank you for that. We're like knocking down those doors, huh, Denise? We don't huh. knock. You have, to, you have to knock them down. Down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think this crowd will be comfortable with that. Yes. So, uh, gotta, gotta knock some doors down. It's necessary right now. So, I want to work on describing the current climate and work on us all helping to define some areas of growth from our own personal perspectives. Uh, we all work in different professions that gives us a different level of perspective or insight that most don't have. And I think I want to start up with Denise. So give me some political, uh, some political perspectives, some things that you all have been working on address diversity, equity, and inclusion right now at the present time? 
Okay, so um, collectively, we have um, drafted a hate crimes bill um, that recently has um, the governor, he had a press conference a couple weeks ago about that. Um, Senator Joyce Elliott introduced it back in 2001, I believe, and it's been floating around since then. So um, hopefully we have no traction to get that passed in the 93rd session, which starts in January. Um, for me, um, the hate crimes legislation uh, will protect um, different communities. Um, so for me, that's in, um, equality for me. Is that right, <laughs> Amber? <laughs> um, so <laughs> uh, that's one thing. Another thing I'm working on, well, that's a collective thing we all working on, but another thing I'm working on is um, period poverty. Um, that's the real thing here in Arkansas and it's all over, you know, all over the world. Um, that way you can, the, the girls that we're helping or want to help so they can have uh, feminine hygiene products at school because um, what we've learned, uh, most schools can't keep enough of those products um, on the shelf and the teachers, nurses, and whoever are coming out of their pockets um, to fulfill that need. So for me, um, that's, that's inclusive, right, Amber? Because <laughs> you're including girls who otherwise would not have that and we want people to stay in school and what we've learned with uh, period, period poverty, sorry, um, girls are less likely to go to school that week while they are on their cycle because they don't have anything. And also too, they might practice unsafe hygiene product, I mean, hygiene practices. So for me, that's inclusive. So those are some of the things and other things that we're working on. I think one thing I want to hear you talk about a little bit is representation in politics, okay. making sure that you feel like the body that surrounds you actually, actually and accurately represents the people it serves. So what are you doing there? Are there any efforts in bringing in representation? Um, yes. I mean, we, we have a big election that's coming up in November. Uh, we have other women of color that are running for um, House seats and Senate seats. So that's deciding um, to see, you know, how that's all going to play out. And I think the more women and or more black women there at the table, we can really work on these three major pieces, diversity, inclusion, and, and equity. Um, and I'm excited about what's going to happen in a couple, well, next month or so. Um, and so that, I think that will help bring more inclusion and all that stuff to the table when we get more people that look like, like us or more women, I think that's gonna help the cause. All right, thank you for that. Amber, academic perspective. Um, when we think about educational equity um, or inclusivity and what that looks like, I think it's first the acknowledgement of the populations that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, we can hand out iPads to all students, but equity is like how many of those students have internet once you give them that device. Um, we can talk about removal of, you know, standardized testing, but let's talk about the barriers that caused us to need to remove, you know, standardized testing or the barriers to standardized testing. A lot of times we want to do these quick solves in education, like, well, let's make sure everyone has supplies. Are we fixing the reason that supplies weren't had in the first place? Because it's not just, oh, parents don't care. So mm -hmm. for me, being able to make sure that we're looking at the systemic reason and not using these one solve issues or these one stop shops to think that we're fixing a problem. You know, um, when it comes to the implicit bias that we have, um, we have often this visceral reaction to even hearing the words Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. right? And it is at this point being associated with parties and politics when the sentence itself has absolutely nothing to do with an organization, okay? We're talking about Little Rock, just Little Rock in itself and LRSD. Whether Black Lives Matter is essential to the foundation and fundamentals of teaching in the curriculum if 70% of the students are Black. That mm -hmm. is something that has to be looked at. 
the sentence is something that has to be reckoned with with administrators with teachers and every single person that's going to touch those students lives because whether they matter and let's also be extremely clear that matter is the minimum that's being asked matter literally says that it is a subject of consideration so i think that our students when we're talking about education deserve more than a subject of consideration when we're talking about their lives and knowing that education will follow them for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. I really feel like you need a whole nother 10 minutes, but <laughs> for the sake of time, I'm going to push on. Um, Marty, you're up next. Give us some idea of what happens in your professional settings in regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we're at a, a really critical and interesting point, um, whether you're talking banking or a variety of other uh, public corporations. We're looking out into our own communities, our own lived experience and the news. And you've got a lot of conversations in which um, leadership are looking at their own policies and procedures to see what are we getting right and what have we possibly missed? What are our blind spots that we should be more aware of? And so I am witnessing a lot of more intentional thought, um, not always quick solutions, because I think a lot of times, first one must become educated and aware before they can come up with a meaningful solution. So um, one particular federal regulator, the, the Federal Reserve Bank, has an office dedicated, an entire um, division that is literally devoted to DEI. And that is really a powerful commitment and statement. And they're also watching downstream the, for example, financial institutions that they engage with, the vendors that they hire as well. So I think there is more and more awareness that just because you have a policy on the surface and on the face that is uh, promoting diversity and equality, it may not actually be accomplishing um, what you say that you seek to accomplish. And I give an example of a, a major um, corporation in another part of the country who looked at their workforce and said, this representation mix is really, really weird. And it's, we're getting these applicants, but we're not seeing individuals in these particular positions. And we know we all have a variety of biases, whether we're aware of them or not. And once they took off like the name, address um, of the individual zip code, the name of the schools in which a person um, graduated and the hiring managers could not see this information, it became really clear to them that a lot of bias was happening in that first mm -hmm. of review. Um, and so then they took that off. They started to see a different mix of individuals make it to the interviewing process, right? And once those individuals had an opportunity to mm -hmm. actually represent themselves and possibly push through some of the biases that the hiring managers uh, may not have realized they had, but according to their policies, they weren't being biased, if you know what I mean. Um, they started to see changes in the distribution of representation across um, their company, and that stuck with me. And so we have a lot of entities that are trying to figure out okay, what are we doing right and what do we need to consider looking at differently? So I anticipate we're going to continue to see more and more corporations in this space, whether they create an official position or an office, I think you're going to see or hear about more um, companies that are trying to figure out how to be better. That's awesome. All right, so that leaves Jennifer. What do you have from the philanthropic, I always do this, philanthropic perspective? There's so many P's and silent F's go right ahead. So the DEI <laughs> space for philanthropy looks a lot of the same as it does in industry and education. And we kind of have to follow their lead in terms of how we reconstruct and take a look, especially, and I'll talk a little bit about leadership. Now, on a national level, you'll see 
um, major things happening. We have standing committees happening on boards. We have individuals that are, are becoming part of the conversation as young professionals and starting those early traces. So um, philanthropy foundations and nonprofits are seeing that at a national level. Mm -hmm. Then there's our local level. Our leadership looks a lot different, whether we're providing services or, um, you know, nonprofits and foundations are working to better the community, better lives. So as they continue to serve, it's starting real slowly with those leadership roles in that, wow, none of us look like or sound like or have any idea of the people who are serving, yet we're just doing this great mm -hmm. um, you know, philanthropy or bringing this great service or product. Um, Marty mentioned how their leadership starts and, and it kind of trickles down. It's the same thing for the nonprofits. Um, they're having to, to recruit and look for individuals that have that voice, that have a different idea or perspective or story or history that really can make their philanthropy stand out over others. So if you're going to serve or you're going to provide, um, you know, Amber mentioned the things about the school. There's a number of nonprofits that go into schools with best intentions to help serve after school lunches. Well, who's serving the after school lunches? You know, you, you can't give a child um, a bag of a popcorn to, to, to microwave and they have no microwave to do it in or a warm up lunch or something that needs refrigeration. So philanthropy has to take a really, really hard look at who our leadership is. And I see a great um, amount of effort being done at a national level, but locally, it's, there's still so much work to be done um, in central Arkansas and the surrounding areas. Um, good intentions, but not always delivering the best um, solutions without having that different point of view or perspective. Thank you for that. So I want to start thinking big picture here. And this question is for anybody on the panel first to answer. You get 10 points. I can't directly hand them to you, but I'll keep tally on my side. Um, what does a fully diverse, equitable, and inclusive society look like? 2042. Okay. <laughs> well, it's true. I gave a, a date. Um, I mean, it's been estimated that our, our, our space will look a lot different very soon. And it's, true. it's the most excitable thing there is, but we've got a lot mm -hmm. of work to make sure that as we continue to um, advance, um, mm -hmm. that that's, that's, this is part of the conversations that we have with everyone. And does 2042 primarily just look like a different and what the average citizen yeah. looks like that it's, that it's, goes back to the national perfect. geographic yeah 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 it's cool. definitely cool. just just the date of suggested <laughs> I would love for everything to um on this conversation to uh to be what we what we wish for but i know what it'll look like i think that a a diverse, equitable, and inclusive society. One, like, yes, in 2042, when we have a more, that's still diversity, right? Mm -hmm. Inclusion and equity we're, are going to take a little bit more work because if we have the same structures and barriers in place, then we're just going to have more people being oppressed by the same structures and barriers versus, you know, the few that move up and um, things like that. I think that one, being able to center voices that need to be centered. Mm -hmm. I think that is first and foremost. A lot of times, uh, movements, if you will, get recentered, um, and they don't often look like the people that started the movement. So I think that is first and foremost. If we're going to say that uh, whether it's Black Lives Matter, Me Too, the LGBT movement, who's heading these voices? Does it look like the population in which they're serving, right? The example mm -hmm. would be, uh, recently I was asked to speak at a Black Lives Matter rally. Um, by a white male. And I was like, okay, all right, well, who's on the agenda? Not one black person on the actual coordinating team. That's one tokenism, because you chose me and there's no one else there who looks like me. But two, when you were planning this event, there is a difference between engagement versus outreach. 
Mm-hmm. Outreach is when we go out, and that's like when Jennifer was saying, we go out, we have the best intentions, and we're going to do all this change, and we are doing outreach. And we go, and I'm like, I'm going to rebuild these neighborhoods. I'm about to put up some pictures on the wall. And the person is saying, I just needed some socks. Did you ask me if I needed socks? That's engagement. Engagement is where we ask what is needed before we even start doing anything. If we ask the populations that we're trying to reach, what do you need? How can I support you? That is what inclusivity and equitable societies look like. Three, it also looks like being able to reckon with the fact that as wide as diversity is, until we're able to reckon with the past and understand what racism is, what systemic racism is, and not just what an anti-racist society looks like, but let's be real, what an anti-black society looks like. Because while all forms of hate and discrimination are wrong, they are also not dished out equally. They are also not experienced equally. So I think it's also important to make sure that even though we are understanding that diversity has a broad landscape, that even if you're talking about uh, the black diaspora in particular, in Britain, you are 10 times more likely to be pulled over by the police as a black person than a white person, but only, but you're still three times more likely to be pulled over as a black person than an Asian person. So while discrimination and all forms of hate are wrong, they are not experienced equally. So a equitable and inclusive society understands that we need to reckon with anti-racism and anti-blackness in this country. Thank you for that. Ooh, that was... That was powerful. I know, I need I know you, you actually get 20 <laughs> points for following up behind Amber. Re-center. I just want to, I want to pick, thank you for that. Um, I want to piggyback on part of that. Um, in this country, I would love for us to actually teach and learn American history. Mm-hmm. Number one, um, American history in this country has been taught from an indoctrination perspective. And it leaves out so many voices, so many stories. And through K through 12, there's a certain level of this is who America is and was. And I think we do ourselves a disservice. So to me, to get in a true, meaningful DEI space is number one, we retell our story and we tell our story correctly. Um, Because a lot of people just don't know. You don't know what you don't know, right? And so I think we do ourselves a huge disservice. And if we can fix that part, I think a lot of these other challenges that we have would start to tumble because other voices would be respected, intersectionality would be recognized, and the various forms of structural discrimination that have happened throughout our founding would be connected to the now. Um, Because one of the things I think most people just fundamentally don't get, how did we arrive to the place that we are in right now? It did not happen overnight. It did not happen by accident. Um, But we don't know that unless you decide on your own to invest a lot of time and resources to research and pull out information and then try to figure it out and piece it together. So a lot of public, public policies and vantage points have shifted over time, but we have never stopped to consider the impact of having had that in place and how it's cumulative over time. And then we do these one-off little fixes, but they, as Amber pointed out, they never get to the root issue. And so people get frustrated in all walks, education, philanthropy, you name it, like why aren't we seeing more change? Well, typically we're not recognizing the numerous intersections that we all um, occupy. I tell people all the time uh, when I talk about being a black female, I am um, not the representation for all black people. I am not the representation for all women voices, but the fact that I am both black and female has a different voice, a different legacy, a different history, and a different experience um, here in this country. So from a DEI perspective, The fact that having these different intersections, the complex history that this country had, once we can recognize and honor these things, I think we will see meaningful change. I don't know if it's 2042. Um, I may be a little bit more skeptical on that. (laughs) (laughs) But I think it's very aspirational. (laughs) 
an event planner, a true event planner, I have to put a date down, you know? <laughs> I have to plan, you have to plan for the future. Nice. Even just piggybacking on what Mari said, if I may, like we talk about the intersectionality and what that looks like. We have said there's been so much in the media about women having 100 years to vote. Women have been able to vote for 100 years. Not so, necessarily. Who are these women? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I want us to be able to make sure that we tell these stories accurately. In 1920, women who looked like me stood on those same steps with Susan B. Anthony and said, we want the right to vote. And in 1965, I was still standing on those same steps asking for the right to vote as a black woman. So it's one thing for us to acknowledge that while there are several different forms of oppression, whether it is patriarchy, whether it is nationalism, whether it is monolanguagism, whether there, it does not matter, the intersectionality is the fact that until society works for the most vulnerable of us, it works mm -hmm. for none of us. It's my quiet class instead of, I don't have a whole crowd behind me. All I'm right. A, I go I, yes, you can. So for me, DEI uh, in 2042, and um, like Marty, I don't know if we're going to get there um, in 2042, but DEI to me um, looks, if it's in a fair world where we don't always have to fight to protect our rights. Um, you know, and I think about John, the late great John Lewis, who died protecting our voting rights. Um, DEI for me is where you, where in a perfect world, you don't have to always, you know, find, you know, have a group of people always trying to dismantle things, where it's a fair, a fair um, for everybody, like education, where you don't have to always um, advocate for your son's education for him to get the same things that everybody else is getting, where I could go to the voting booth and vote, you know, the way I want to without having different systems work against me. That's how DEI looks for me in the future. Thank you for that, Denise. Now, I guess next. Like we're all out of business. How about that? When there is no need for diversity, equity, and inclusion specialists, yes. that's, that, when, that's when we've reached where we're supposed to be, when we don't have yeah. to have this panel. Amen. So this next question I have for the group, it's what steps can we take to become more diverse, equitable, and inclusive professionally and personally? And this is me giving a, me asking you guys to give me a range of actionable steps, small to large. But I also want to throw in there the amount of care given to the individuals who are actually doing the work. This is something I personally struggled with in the course of this movement is somehow there are only 10 people on a list that everybody calls and you're worn out, you're tired. You don't have enough answers to give, and Lord knows you want to help everybody, but you also understand that there needs to be more of you or a Xerox machine that allows you to duplicate yourself. So in answering this question and being able to give a range of actionable SNPs, small to large, what are we doing to actually try to achieve this diverse, equitable, and inclusive, uh, inclusive space, both professionally and personally? On a, on a personal and interpersonal level is where I like to start because I can work with organizations all day. I can work with institutions and their leadership, but if they haven't started the personal work and the intrapersonal work necessary to even begin looking through that lens, then it doesn't matter. So the first thing I say, educate yourselves. We are a country and a society that prides ourselves on how smart we are. But if you are shocked by hearing that I was still on them steps in 1965, there's some work that has to be done. If we are surprised by hearing about current ICE internment camps, but not knowing that the Japanese have been in those same internment camps on this soil, we're not doing ourselves justice to the history that needs to be told in this country. Um, if we are still shocked by the fact that yes, the Emancipation Proclamation was written in this year, but then the 13th Amendment says you can arrest people that look like me if they were loitering or didn't have a job. We're not doing ourselves service. 
and being able to not one. Um, the thing is, like you said, we keep calling on the same people for these answers, right? So it allows us to be the scholars that we pride ourselves on being in these same spaces, the same way we research everything else to do that first. Secondly, um, a lot of what is also happening is after the information is received, it has to be reckoned with emotionally. Do the emotional labor on your own. If you come to me with your hands full of guilt and shame, you cannot use them to help me dismantle the systems I'm trying to break down. So I can't do anything with your hands full of shame and guilt, and I need you to reckon with that before you come to those people asking them for help, right? I didn't know. Stop. Stop, stop. Everybody has the news. If you have been under a rock, then we saw the things that have been going on. Say it didn't affect me until this year. It didn't touch me until now. But be honest with the people that you're talking to. So having transparent and authentic conversations are necessary. And being able to, one, research, do the emotional work, have transparent and authentic conversations, and then Figure out what you can do by asking the same people that you are trying to help. Before you go out making moves, ask them, how may I support you? How can I help you? What is it that I can do with my, whatever your privilege is? I am an able-bodied woman. I do not have intellectual disabilities. I'm able to levy or leverage that privilege in spaces where maybe those people are unable to be heard. I need to ask them how to do that first before I go in thinking I'm the savior of any population or any group. So I say start with the inside first, whether you are the president of a company or the next door neighbor, start with yourself first. Thank you. Am I going to get 20 points again for fun? Yes. <laughs> yes. Follow on Amber is a, this is it's a daily double. So go right ahead. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and I do watch Jeopardy. Um, <laughs> um, so one thing that we need help with and really trying to focus, and it seems like a simple first step, but I think it's one of the hardest steps, is to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. These are heavy, heavy topics, and a lot of us don't have the full language and understanding, but we have a desire desire to want to do better because I think intrinsically we want to do good. I just think that as uh, fellow human beings, we want to do good. We want to contribute in a positive way to our society and our neighborhood and our community, however we define that. But sometimes as soon as someone says something that is different from my experience, I get very uncomfortable and defensive. Step one, we got to learn to go ahead and get comfortable in that uncomfortable space. Mm -hmm that provides us with the opportunity to grow. Um, another thing that I think we really, um, it seems, once again, I think there's small complicated steps is working on our language. Right? Because we decide for others what words shall be used, especially as we apply to them. Um, I will not refer to myself as African American, for example, and people normally look at me in a certain way. There's a whole story. I'm Black. Black is okay to say I'm black. It's okay for you to recognize black. It's okay to live black. I am not a person of color. I'm actually having a t-shirt made. Um, I'm a black woman. I'm not a person of color. That nebulous dumping ground of everyone who is not white, which once again centers whiteness and puts everyone else in the same category. And as Amber mentioned earlier, our experiences are fundamentally different. <laughs> our histories are fundamentally different what um, different populations are needing within that socially constructed uh, racial group are fundamentally different. So I want to be recognized, seen, heard, celebrated as being, as, Jane Brown, as James Brown so eloquently says, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Yes. I'm proud. Yes. <laughs> um, so the yes. whole language <laughs> piece as well. We got a lot of very um, complex things to do that inner work is is crucial because we can create laws to the cows come home we can do but we can't legislate the heart and at the end of the day it's people interfacing and interacting with people people mm -hmm. make decisions people enact laws people engage with other people so yes we have to do the legislative work which is so very important we've got to do that head hand heart connection to really have meaningful 
uh, meaningful change. So that's 20 more points for Marty. Just you points. are up on the leaderboard, Marty, if you need it to know. <laughs> I'm actually taking I'm going after her <laughs> next time because I want points. So <laughs> can I add something real quick? Yes, you may. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think, too, you know, seeking opportunities to be in a diverse group. You know, sometimes we sit in our own separate um, silos, if you will. I think mm -hmm. sometimes just, you know, join a group that maybe you never thought about joining and maybe you'll gain a different perspective on how things are. Don't always just sit in your own little bubble because sometimes when you sit in your own little bubble, you don't realize what's going on. And, you know, we all have our in inherent biases, but sometimes when you look, when you go outside of that, you can kind of recognize what your your biases are. You can help yourself with that. And you can help other people with their biases. Um, another thing too, um, it's one thing to acknowledge that things are not equal, but it's another thing to invite people to the table. Um, you know, we can always say, oh, well, yeah, that's, that's bad, that sucks, but how many of these people are inviting us to the table so we can um, figure out what's going on, so we have a voice in what's going on, so, you know, we can all learn, like uh, I think Marty said about the pie. We, the pie is big enough for everybody, why should only one group of people have the pie? We all should have a slice of the pie. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Denise. So for me, from a, from a personal standpoint, again, I'm, I'm Jennifer, just Jennifer, and I don't represent every um, Latinx community. You know, I'm Hispanic. There's Puerto Rican. There's, there's a million other um, of individuals that look like me, but that maybe don't speak like me or have my story. Um, the best thing to do personally on that standpoint is similar to what Denise said, join the committee. Um, I would, had the opportunity to sit on a city committee after I shared no one there looks like me, sounds like me, has, has children like me, and they're making decisions about our neighborhoods and what industry is coming in and out. You know, I'm, I'm the future and I want to sit at that table. So you do have to get out there on that one-on-one -on -one level and put yourself in that uncomfortable space to be heard. On a professional level, I kudos to all national organizations that are making this change, but locally we have a lot of work to do. It's embracing again what Marty said in telling your story, understanding your history, but then empowering the people to make that decision. Don't call all the same people to serve on your boards. Don't call all the same people to serve in the same capacity. We're doing it. We're doing a lot of it. There's other people out there that can do it as well. So professionally, I encourage all those nonprofits to, to engage a younger field, to get those young professionals why they can, create a standing committee that's something else they can do, create a standing committee that addresses this, and hopefully that standing committee is done and does their job and can evaporate and not be needed. But there's a lot of work to do, but you have to do more than just check that box. You have to create the environment for not just the invitation, but make sure they have that dance partner. Make sure they are first on the agenda. Make sure that that person, race, ethnicity, age, abilities, all of that is, is there. And that's how, that's how you work at it, professionally and personally. Can I add something to that, Emma? <laughs> um, yeah. Also, too, um, people in leadership, you know, recognize and talent when you see it. Mm -hmm. you run to that person at the coffee shop or wherever at Walmart, Target, Kmart, where, not Kmart, sorry, um, Kroger, um, Kroger's, you know, if you see somebody that you know, you know, you know, encourage them, you know, you know, strike up a conversation and try to get them in the fold because, you know, eventually we're going to get too old one day and, you know, there's other things that we want to do and you want to encourage and foster the younger generation. So, you know, each one teach one. If you see somebody who's eager, you know, have them come with you, have them come to a meeting with you, um, explain how different things work. So I think sometimes, and this is probably another subject, but sometimes um, certain people hold these positions or hold power and they don't want to um, let go of it. But you have to let go of it. You have to let the younger generation come in behind you. So just opening up opportunities for other people to serve. 
The servant leader role is definitely important in this space. Understanding that you are here to educate and support and encourage those to come behind you is definitely something that I, I know personally I've been focused on because 24 hours is all I'm given in a day. And sometimes I try to make it 28 and it's nice to have a person alongside you to help carry that. So we have some questions from the audience. Brenda asked, what keeps the panel motivated for social change? My children. Oh. Oh. Go ahead. Um, my children, um, I have three children and um, just looking at them, you know, you, it makes me want to work harder to protect the environment and education and all those other things, the quality of life. So that's what motivates me, my kids and other kids here in Arkansas. Um, that's my motivation is the kids because we have to leave something for the future. And um, my kids are my motivation. I most certainly am the mother of two black sons. And so that um, definitely will motivate, I guess, me in a different way because it scares the heck out of me knowing that they're getting bigger and taller in this current society. The other part that motivates me is that I have to believe that, like Marty said, the average person wants to do better. Mm -hmm. The average person just doesn't know. The average person may look at news stories and think, oh, those poor people or all oh, those, you know, and I don't mean poor literally in the economic sense. I mean, we often have sympathy, but the empathy to me is a lack of knowledge. And I have to believe that once those stories are told in different ways that people are willing to engage differently and that that is what creates change. And I also am encouraged by the shoulders that I know I stand I know that there are women before me that I venerate those spirits every day so that I can call on those same ancestors to give me fuel for tomorrow. Because if I don't, you know, if not me, then who? And if not now, when? So that's mm -hmm. kind of for me. Amber stole my line. If not me, then who? That was definitely it. My children are a huge inspiration in, in making change happen. Um, but I want to change before they even got here. You know, I, I've wanted it my whole life. I've served coffee in boardrooms just to have a seat at the table. I've brought the lunch. Um, so again, we are standing on some big shoulders. And it's hard not to reflect on how far we've come and not take for granted that all that work it has not been easy but you continue to push you continue to um, guide and you continue to mentor and you use your knowledge to push your sister up you know you don't have mm -hmm. to um, be the one with the crown let her wear the crown you know be the one to encourage that that change um, so besides my kids it's just I don't I think my sanity I have to think that there's something better. There, ha there has to be more of a reason to engage and, and you know, set a future that's brighter for everyone. So, whew, this, this is one of those answers that I'm gonna try not to cry. I don't cry, mm -hmm. I cry to you. Um, what keeps me motivated? I often speak of my three girls and they are all resting peacefully in heaven. Um, I think about the journey of my great grandmother. I think about my grandmother and her journey and I think about my moms and they will forever inspire me and push me to keep the, the fight going. So I feel like I have an obligation to honor who they um, were on this earth and who they mean to me to this very day to honor as I'm the last of the girls, there used to be four of us, I'm the last of the girls in that lineage to keep it going and moving forward. And they pass the baton on to me, so I have to keep running in this relay race. One day we're gonna finish this race. Um, don't know what it's gonna look like, but the race will be finished. Um, and so they keep me motivated on, and I understand the, the black mother of a son, oh, my gosh, the fear that you have is and and my baby son, who is six foot seven, um, is so anti every stereotype that people would assign to him. The lack of sleep that a black mother has from a kid starting to age five until he ages beyond at least 35. It, it is a level of stress 
that I don't wish on anyone. But, um, but my three girls are my inspiration that keeps me in this space and moving forward because I feel I'm obligated to do so. Thank you for that. All right, ladies, the questions have now moved. I don't know what Alex Trebet would do beyond daily doubles, but they're getting serious. So bear with me. Uh, Barbara wrote, how is the spirit of colonialism or imperialism dismantled in leadership for leadership to be open to receive other voices? Money. Everybody likes to make money. And I, I mean, I, I hate to say that because we talked about the intrapersonal work necessary, but mm -hmm. um, diversity makes money. Having diverse perspectives in leadership and at the table is profitable in every single business that you can name and in every single field. It just is. Um, having more women at the table, <laughs> having more um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color at the table, it makes a difference. Having more perspectives, having more ideology, but then after those people are at the table, it is incumbent upon us at the table to not be silent. And I encourage those people that once I'm at the table, I want to make so much room. I want to make so much room that I make enough room and take up so much space that three people can sit down beside me. A lot of times we get in spaces and we don't want to lose that spot. We're mm -hmm. afraid to speak out because we don't want to say something because they'll just replace me. Well, you're going to replace me after I said it. How about that? You're going to replace me after I've said what is necessary to be heard and for me to say, because when I'm silent, I am still afraid. Like Audrey Lord said, so it is necessary for me to speak up because they'll kill me and say I enjoyed it if I don't. So I am going to make room. I'm going to take up space. And once I have that space, I'm going to let other people sit down too. I'm Amber, you can script this. This is, uh, you are amazing. Ladies, anybody else want to weigh in on that particular question? I think one of the challenges um, in the leadership space, um, people do business with more often than not, people who are like them. Mm. So there has to be a, an extreme level of an intentionality to go outside of that which is comfortable and familiar. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. situations where everyone went to the same school, they lived in the same neighborhood, they went to the same church, they played in the same um, sports teams, and so they have this real comfort level, right, that mm -hmm. requires mm -hmm. less work. So if I'm hiring from or picking people to move into these positions that I have that base familiarity with, that limits diversity and leadership because it becomes this, you don't have a proven track record. I really am not familiar or comfortable with your, your framework. So it requires a lot of intentionality. So to me, to, my answer is it has to be a very intentional effort and the standard for success and how you define success has to be um, modified. Thank you for that, Marty. Anybody else, Denise? Jennifer, anybody want to weigh in on that one? Read to everything they say. It's just moving away from the norm, you know, mm -hmm. just and bringing that down, whatever your normal is. It shouldn't feel normal. It, you know, moving from that norm will, um, again, maybe not the total answer, but what I would respond to the question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Denise, did you have anything to add? Thank you. Next question comes from Kathy. She says, what would you say to anyone that is trying to get a seat at the table but can't seem to get in the door? Kathy, I would build a new building, um, build a much larger table. Probably, I, I mean, I love design, so it would be opulent. The chairs would be beautiful. <laughs> and I would invite all types of wonderful people to it. But I'll pass it over to our panelists to answer their questions. I agree with you, Emma. I think if you can't find that seat at the table, you need to create your own table and do all the things that you did not like about the table that you were trying to sit at. Um, sometimes it's about finding a champion. I mean, if we're going to be honest, mm -hmm. it has always taken the majority to assist the minority. 
Susan B. Anthony would still be standing on those steps if a, if a male hadn't said, maybe we should listen to them. Um, it took a heterosexual president to make legislation for LGBTQ plus marriage. So it will always say it was not until um, King's white clergymen mar marched with him until the nation said, let me take a look and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So there's somebody at that table that has somebody in their life that you remind them of. And that's just real. Okay. Find that person, do your research as well and find your avenue into that table. And then the other part is you can look at it like our book, Mr. Fuller. He says that build a new model that makes the old model obsolete, just like Denise said. So you can build your, your table and make your table so amazing. They forget about that other table. Everybody leaves that party, comes to your table, and then you don't have to worry about having a spot at that table. Mm -hmm. Marty, anything to add to that or Jennifer? Um, whoo, ditto, ditto. Um, <laughs> I will say that building a coalition is, is partially critical, depending upon which professional endeavor that you're in, because some systems, to be honest, you can't start over and build a table and, and the runway, if you're so mm -hmm. a runway to do that is not necessarily possible or feasible, but building a coalition, if you can find a champion, um, find one, develop one, build upon. I think one of the other things we have to do is to be open to sharing space. As Amber had mentioned, a lot of times people get in positions and they don't want to share space because of fear. They also um, are scared to vocalize because they're fearful of retribution. So I think that opportunity to try to always be aware that you're carrying others with you and let that also inform your level of engagement as you're trying to push. I often say, I'm not just trying to get through a glass ceiling, I'm trying to get through a concrete one as well. Um, because depending once again on your silo, our histories are so complicated in this space. Also developing a personal brand. Um, and be very confident in who you are in which others are also seeking um, for you. So continuously strive to get better, be better, and, and be fully who you are, because that will draw certain energies to you, certain people to you, certain opportunities to you as well. Mm -hmm. All right. The questions are getting longer, ladies. Uh, Tina writes, in response to the importance of educating people to understand what has brought us here, I would love to hear your thoughts on an educational platform I founded that has free educational resources for kids and families of all types, including Black history. I am looking for a committee of thought leaders to review what we have and let us know what else we need to, to add. And so she left her contact information. I think what I'll do there is just make sure I share that information back to you ladies and you guys can feel free to reach out to Tina. Um, here's a question. How do we affect change within our organization in leadership slash boards? Oh, I love that one. So, uh, Marty uh, kind of mentioned the whole coalition building. There has to be that established standing committee on a board that addresses um, constantly what, what that organization is doing, how they're going about and being proactive of change and how they are um, engaging and getting that range of perspective um, for the organization. So um, the best thing that they can do is to create that space that we were talking about and fill it up, fill it up with individuals. It's, it's not the norm. You've got to get over that. Um, you've got to, to look and feel, it has to look and feel different if you expect a different outcome. You can't do the same thing and expect everything just to be um, part of the times. Don't wait for it, for it to happen. Um, create it. Create that space. Thank you. Anyone else want to give some feedback on that question? I often say intentional inclusivity is moving from asking who's at the table to asking who's not at the table that should be at the table. 
and did they get the detailed instructions to the location of the table and upon arrival, a microphone and a chair. So if you're going to say this is what we're looking for and you're going to be intentional about it, make sure that once they get there, like Jennifer said, that they have the voice and that you give them the, that you empower them, if you will, to have the voice and acknowledge that mirroring ourselves is real. Affinity bias is real. Affinity bias is where we simply like things that are mm -hmm. like ourselves. If you've ever had a new friend or a new love interest, you probably said, we have so much in common. And all you really just said is, I like myself. So um, just be mindful that we can mirror ourselves unintentionally because that is, we are vain as humans. And so if we're going to be intentional about it, make sure that the same people that you're asking to be there have a voice once they get there. Would anyone else like to add anything? I would just like to give this statement. Um, please recognize it takes a lot of courage to speak up. There's a lot of fear, a lot of, I mean, and that making someone else uncomfortable or not living up to whatever projection or expectation that is being applied to an individual is a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. So when someone does speak up, it takes a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. um, so And so providing spaces in which people can be courageous, whether that is listening to a different perspective, feeling uncomfortable, and working through it, there's great value on the um, end of that process that everyone grows um, through that experience. But it takes a lot of courage, trust me, as a woman mm -hmm. that's, who speaks out in all settings in which she is involved, it takes a lot of courage. And can I just say also, accept the no. We've said that a lot of times the same people are called upon to sit on various boards, various commissions for the same thing. And the same way you only knew that one, you, I'm, I'm the only black friend that I tell my friend, if I'm the only black one you have, you're not doing your work. But the thing is, I may know 10 that I can call on. So if I say, no, I'm unable to, let me get you the name of someone better trust my recommendation as well. Trust the recommendation that you would have given to me because we're not going to hand them out lightly. If I have worked to get in a space, if I have worked to have my reputation, if I have worked to be an expert in my field, I'm not going to hand you someone that would be anything less. So trust mm -hmm. the recommendation and accept the no when necessary because those people are tired. Yes. And to that point, knowing that people are tired, how do we move past this just being a moment and make it something that lasts? Because we, we are tired. We came out of the gate strong. And if you ladies are anything like me, I put every ounce of my life into making a difference. And I think I have since I've, I was born. But this is one that has been extraordinarily taxing. Um, it takes you away from all the comforts that we once had in our life to be the ones to talk about the things that are sometimes uncomfortable. Um, they're very rarely ever politically correct. And in order to be a change maker requires you to be a lot of times seen as the problem. So how, how do we stay motivated? How do we keep this movement going? How do we trudge forward in the face of adversity and make sure that lives are counted and that diversity, equity, and inclusion are no longer having to be talked about as if they're these three new things that just appeared on the shelf at Dillard's, but are something that are just like our utilities. They're required for us to all live happy and whole lives. So I'll, I'll jump first, um, to give someone else an opportunity to gain points after Amber, um, and say this, I don't think we're having a moment. I think we're having a moment and where the spotlight has been intensified, but we've always been in a movement. The work has never been finished. Mm -hmm. that when I say, when I reach back to my great grandmother, who was born in 1903, was doing the work in 1903. Mm -hmm. Movement has never changed. Sometimes we don't pay as much attention to the work that is going on at all times. As you mentioned, Me Too was going on long before 
it got uh, national attention. The concept of Black Lives Matter, whether called officially by that term, has been <laughs> underway a lot longer than from what we're seeing locally. When we think about um, the pursuit of civil rights by Black uh, Americans in particular, it didn't start with Dr. King either. Um, and it didn't end with Dr. King mm -hmm. either. So I think we have been in a movement for a very long time. I think we have a particular moment, an opportunity to capitalize upon the level of attention that we could craft forward or develop a future or a pathway that actually will put us in a healthier space over time if we have the courage and the will to do so. Anyone else? I agree. We are in a movement and not a moment. Um, I think that we have the opportunity right now to do something so special because we are currently in the largest civil rights movement ever. And I say that because there are more countries standing with us around the world than ever before. We have more allies right now in this fight than we have ever had. Being able to say, look at what's going on. Um, as far as continuing that same fight, treat it like a torch. Mm -hmm. I can't, I, I will burn out if I am only allowing my work to be, to, to shine, if I'm only working on igniting myself and I'm only working on refueling me. If I can spark somebody else and they spark five other people and they spark five other people, that's how we keep it going. It's not, it's making sure that I, it's not one salient voice that we have a chance to remake, not just because of the Black Lives Matter movement that's going on right now, but COVID. We have talked about how antiquated the educational system is. Let's redo it. Mm -hmm. We've talked about how health care isn't doing this, this, this. Let's redo it. We have a time right now that we've never had before. Mm -hmm. We have never if I hear the word unprecedented one more time in 2020, <laughs> I'm going to lose it, okay? But the fact is, we've never been here before. A global pandemic of this magnitude that slowed the world down, this is a whole new earth. And if we treat it like that, if we treat today's cultural landscape like clay for the forming and use all the hands and voices that we didn't use the first time to form it this go round. There is no more movements. There is no more moments necessary. We will have, we get to focus on who has better ice cream and not who has a seat at the table. We have a chance to do something really special if we do it right. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, I like to say, um, drawing on the strength of our, our ancestors, like Marty eloquently said, and Amber, uh, you know, this is nothing new for um, our right for black people. We've been doing it for a long time and the, the struggle still continues. Um, drawing on that strength and uh, to know that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, even with legislation, you have to be able to pass certain things. And Marty knows, Amber knows, you know, Jennifer, you too, Emma. Um, it has to be the will of the legislature. Um, and right now we're in a super majority of Republicans and um, not to get too political, And but you have, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. So you have to have the strength to keep on with the marathon. You have to know when to kind of tune out and take care of yourself because, you know, that continuous, you know, mm -hmm. all the past and all these things, COVID, it can really put you in a bad space. So just, you know, maybe find a safe space for you if that's walking, riding your bike, get a massage or whatever. Find whatever that is for you and do it regularly, regularly because we need everybody, we need all hands on deck. We're going to make this world a better place. Thank you. Amber's right. Amber's right. It's, it's a perfect time, even though it's a pandemic, to reset. If you're going to look differently how we're going to teach our children, if you're going to look differently how we're going to have people in office space and you're restructuring your teams, take a look at the basic structure you're building from and rebuild it. You're going to redo everything else. So why not use that as an example? It's, it's time for a fresh start. And 
again, marathon, not a sprint. I'm a true believer of that. Just keep it going, pass the torch. And again, it's a movement. This moment uh, has a little bit more time to it. Thank you, ladies. And one last question. Kathy says, what part do you think social work has in this movement? I think we haven't begun to see the repercussions that will have mental health and the things mm -hmm. that we will see from that. We don't even know what this, if you will, the pandemic, um, what health, you know, uh, repercussions and things they'll have 10 years from now. We don't know if, if it will cause sterilization, all of that. For me, social work right now looks like, even if it's just tips and tools, if you are the professional on like mental health and if you are the professional on what social work as far as not just the mental health portion, but ask the populations, like there's no one answer for that. If you are a social worker and you're saying, how can I help this population, ask them. For me, send me tips and tools on self-care. I forget that self-care has nothing to do with productivity, right? Send me that regularly. Remind me that I don't do self-care so that I can be productive. I need self-care so I don't die, right? <laughs> like, that's what I need. So I say continue to do what is needed, where is needed by asking them how you can support them. Kathy, we're going to need you. We're going to need you real bad. Um, your work maybe hasn't even started. The mm -hmm. aftermath of this pandemic and this movement um, of what, you know, not what I saw as a child, but what my children are seeing um, and seeing it on their phone, seeing it peer to peer, seeing it. I mean, they're integrated with all these different images that, that I didn't quite understand and having to explain. So I think your work is coming even more. And hey, t c contact one of us five and tell us what you want on. We'll get you there. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be your advocate. Tell us, tell us what door we need to knock down. We've been doing it. We're ha I'm happy to contact who I know. Networking. Me too. I'm happy to plug in. Call us. <laughs> All right, ladies. Um, I'm going to leave just a few minutes for any uh, last statements or um, anything that you would like to share in closing as we wind down. Um, I like to say to everybody, please go vote. Um, make you a voting plan. Um, I personally, I'm going to vote in person because I just don't trust the postal system. But, um, but I, and I don't really trust the other system either. And I'm sorry to say that, but it, it's, it, you know, it's getting really <laughs> dicey there. Um, make a voting plan. Um, talk to 10 people. If you need to take somebody to the poll, take somebody to the poll. If somebody need an absentee ballot, I mean, we got the Pulaski County um, clerk, uh, Madam Hollingsworth. Um, her office can help assist you with that. Um, if you need a right to poll, let me know. I have a, a mommy van, so I fill it up. We go to the poll, go get some McDonald's, whatever. Uh, please go vote. Um, if you can stand in line at Kroger's, you could probably stand in line during early voting. But that's your personal preference. But we, we need to go and vote. Um, and like they say, in every election, this election matters. It's unprecedented times. Um, but it really is. So please um, use your, your uh, voice. Please go and vote. Um, no excuses. Let's do it. Anyone else? Um, I'll go next. Um, I just want to conclude with saying I am a person with great hope. My faith requires that I be a person of great hope. I think about my family's journey, all of the struggles we've overcome to get to this moment. So I'm not a person without hope. I look at my own professional career and the journey that it has been on. So I remain hopeful. I still think that inherently uh, people are good at their core and have the best of intentions, not necessarily always the right tools. Um, so I think we're in a moment in this particular level of intensity and focus that every time we can reach a person at that individual level, we can claim success. And so I'm looking forward to continuing with having um, success and moving that needle forward one person at a time. So I'm still hopeful. 
I think I challenge everybody to get engaged. Um, once this pandemic kind of runs aside, I challenge you to take someone um, to your space that isn't normal. Um, invite them to that event. Get a seat for them at that luncheon. Uh, make sure that they're there. Uh, make sure they have the ride, the ticket, and that they, they have the best time. So I, I challenge everyone after listening to our conversation today to be those, those engagers, be the ones that help do the networking. And once we're able to, to get back and start meeting in person, that you are the first one to, to break down that norm. Um, not used to seeing someone at an event, call them to come to the very next one with you. I think that's probably some of the small steps we can do in our community is, is making those invitations happen personally. I am going to challenge all of us to remember back to 2019 at the end when we were making those vision boards and we asked for 2020 <laughs> vision and we put all of that up. I want us to lean into the fact that 2020 gave us everything that we asked for. It we really asked did. for vision. We asked for clarity. We asked for a new site. Many of us, we put it all on our Facebook and culturally and obviously spiritually, we asked for something we weren't ready for. We have seen dust storms from the Sahara this year. Okay. There have been fire natos. There have been <laughs> tropical storms. We have seen inequities on things that were there that have been spotlighted and highlighted in a special way this year. I want us to lean into the new site that 2020 has given us, readjust your glasses, clean them off if you're still not able to see, and understand that your site and your willingness to see things that maybe you weren't able to see before can spark us not having to have a new movement, a new anything. We can fix it if we do it right and see everything that we're supposed to see this year like we asked for. And with that, we are closing a wonderful panel. I have to, I'll be the round of applause. I'd like to thank you all. Marty did win. She was up some 40 odd <laughs> points for coming by. <laughs> Ever with responses. But I do have to say in the midst of uncertainty, I have learned to rest on the things that I have been taught, my faith, my ancestors, a lot of you ladies I know personally, and you all have acted in some way or another to inspire me to push forward and push through. So thank you so much for the opportunity to act as your moderator. And hopefully the Venture Center will let us do this again. And I'll turn it over to Ashley. So thank you all so very much. Absolutely. We will do this again. Not, we're not waiting for 2042 either. We're, we're going to no. keep this conversation going. Um, thank you so much to our panelists. And thank you, thank you, Emma, for moderating. This was fantastic. All the comments coming in, incredible, moving, powerful, so, so good. So thank you all for being a part of this. Uh, Marty, Jennifer, Amber, Denise, Emma, and all the audience for the fantastic questions. And as it was mentioned several times in this panel, getting you know, comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's, that's what's going to happen. And that's what's going to affect change. So thank you all for being a part of this. Our sponsors again, Wright Lindsay Jennings, Frost, CFO Network, the Little Rock Chamber for continuing to support these events. We have several in the pipeline. I encourage you to check those out. We have one this Friday, several next week, and for the rest of the month and for the rest of, you know, whenever. Um, so check those out, register. And again, thank you so much for being a part of today's discussion. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.